Half of Ichang Mountain collapses, Three Gorges Dam opens all 11 spillway gates. Lazy police rescue efforts lead to person being swept away by flood, netizens furious. UN prediction, China's population to decline to 600 million by century's end. Garbage time trends, analysis reveals three major uprisings most feared by the CCP. Global banks cut China's 2024 growth outlook after weak GDP data. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Half of Ichang Mountain collapses, Three Gorges Dam opens all 11 spillway gates. The Three Gorges Dam was reported to be releasing water through all 11 spillway gates for an entire day. The force of the water was described as resembling 10,000 horses galloping and roaring, with an amount equivalent to one West Lake's volume of water being discharged every three minutes. On July 17, numerous posts on the Chinese short video platform Douyin stated that residents in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River were suffering because of this disaster. Even scarier, on July 18, several ex-users reported that a major landslide occurred in Jiajiajian village, Guizhou town, Zigui county, Hubei province, following the release of floodwaters from the Three Gorges Dam. Videos captured massive quantities of earth and rocks rapidly sliding down from the mountain, suggesting that half of the mountain may have collapsed. The landslides also damaged mountain roads, creating a terrifying scene. Netizens reacted with shock, exclaiming, half of a mountain in Ichang has collapsed. Meanwhile, netizens from Hubei reported the situation in other places. One stated that, Shershou County in Jingzhou is almost unable to hold on. Another noted, this morning when I left for work, the island at Bai Sha Zhou was visible, but by the time I returned, it had been submerged. Furthermore, another local described, in front of our house, there's a 50-acre fish pond about 2 meters deep. The volume of water released in this flood event exceeds 50,000 cubic meters per second, which means it could drain the fish pond in just one second. Numerous Douyin users expressed their frustrations, questioning, why do they only release water after heavy rains, and why must all spillways be fully opened? What were they doing before it started raining? What kind of regulation involves storing water during droughts and releasing it during floods? Some lamented, wasn't this dam supposed to prevent flooding for a hundred years? Moreover, they pointed out, it's only open during emergencies, was there no plan in place before the emergency? Both upstream and downstream regions suffer greatly. There should be a thorough investigation. Addressing these concerns, some netizens criticized the CCP for constructing dams mainly for profit. They highlighted that Chinese reservoirs often fail to serve their intended purposes of drought prevention and flood control, instead focusing on generating revenue. They pointed out that associated small hydroelectric stations are leased out, water is sold to farmers during droughts, and reservoirs are used for fish farming, making each ton of water financially valuable. They questioned, how can they release water to alleviate drought? They also noted that only during overwhelming torrential rains do the authorities fully open the spillways, which then results in flooding downstream areas. With the flood water release from the Three Gorges Dam, many cities downstream, from Hubei in the north to Jiangxi in southeast China, face potential disasters. The flooding in Suizhou, Hubei, has already resulted in at least four deaths. Due to the CCP's consistent practice of concealing the true scale of disasters, the reported number of casualties is widely suspected to be severely underreported. Lazy police rescue efforts lead to person being swept away by flood, netizens furious. Recently, a video that has gone viral online shows a river nearing overflow, threatening to submerge a concrete platform along the riverbank. In it, an elderly man, shirtless and possibly using a blue buoyancy block for flotation, clings desperately to the platform's edge, seeking help. Spectators on shore shout anxiously, attempting to assist him. In the footage, two police officers, showing no urgency, approach the man. They seem hesitant to wet their shoes and paws at the platform's edge before reluctantly descending a few steps. This compels the man to struggle closer to them. The officers then grudgingly reach down to grasp his hands. Abruptly and inexplicably, they let go, causing the man to fall back into the river and be swept away. 
the officer's response remains apathetic as they only follow him a few steps before passively observing him drift away. The video has sparked outrage on Platform X, with many viewers expressing anger at the indifference and cold-blooded nature of these two police officers. A contrasting video was also shared by netizens, sarcastically suggesting that the unsuccessful rescue was because the individual's life was deemed less important than the CCP's blood flag. This video depicts a seemingly staged scenario, where one officer stands on the shore, pulling another who enters waist-deep into dirty water to retrieve and subsequently clean a CCP blood flag before bringing it back ashore. Commenters have used these videos to highlight what they see as the CCP's skewed priorities, placing the political regime above human life. Amid ongoing floods across China, from north to south, no senior official from Beijing has visited the affected areas. Victims of these disasters are vocal about their suffering, particularly regarding the sudden release of water from local reservoirs, which has flooded cities and villages, causing immense losses. The official response frequently involves suppressing information and preventing victims from seeking help, while the so-called disaster relief efforts are marred by staged and deceptive actions. Furthermore, some local authorities have even solicited funds from the public under the guise of disaster relief, drawing significant public ire. UN Prediction – China's Population to Decline to 600 Million by Century's End The United Nations, in its recent Global Estimation Report, projects that by 2100, China's population will decline from today's 1.4 billion to 639 million. This projection is a significant drop from the 766.7 million estimated two years ago, primarily due to China's rapidly falling birth rate. What is particularly concerning is not only the decrease in population numbers but also the distortion in the population structure. According to the United Nations, by 2050, 31% of China's population will be over the age of 65. By 2100, this figure is expected to reach 46%, nearly half of the total population. For comparison, these percentages in the United States are expected to be 23% and 28%, respectively. This grim prospect is largely due to the CCP's misuse of state power to aggressively suppress the birth rates in China. In February 1970, the then Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai at a national planning meeting exclaimed, if we can't even plan for population growth, what kind of state planning are we doing? In July 1971, under the strong advocacy of Deng Xiaoping, the CCP's state council explicitly mandated that party committees and revolutionary committees at all levels rigorously enforce family planning. The CCP reasoned that reducing the population would have two benefits. Firstly, it would reduce resource consumption. Secondly, by reducing the number of young dependents, the ratio of the working age population to the non-working population would increase, thus yielding a demographic dividend. The demographic dividend refers to the economic growth effect linked with a higher proportion of the working population within the total population. However, this approach had a price. The birth restrictions imposed 50 years ago have led to a reduction in today's workforce and the number of women of childbearing age. David Huang, an economist in the United States, commented to NTD Television that while the CCP's artificial reduction of the birth rate provided short-term benefits, it has inflicted long-term damage on the economy and society. Looking at the medium to long term, the first problem is that society cannot transition to a consumer society. Secondly, as this generation ages, you will encounter a highly aged society, and the younger people will have to support an increasing number of elderly, leading to a disharmonious population structure. Thirdly, it also distorts the overall social structure and family structures. However, some experts view the United Nations' prediction of China's population numbers at the end of this century as still overly optimistic. Researchers from Victoria University in Australia and the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences estimate that by the century's end, China's population could be just 525 million. This would reduce China's proportion of the global population to its historical lowest. Historically, China's population consistently accounted for one-third of the world total, 37% in 1820, steady at 22% from 1950 to 1980 but only 17% in 2023. 
a robust population base is fundamental to a civilization's prosperity. For example, the Roman Empire and the Han Dynasty, the most populous nations of their time, were also global centers of innovation. The Roman Empire's population peaked at 60 to 80 million, while the Han Dynasty had about 60 million people. At its zenith, the Tang Dynasty had more than 80 million people, followed by the Song Dynasty with an estimated 120 million, surpassing any European nation at that time. China led the world in technological innovations, notably the invention of gunpowder and block printing. With 76 years remaining until the end of this century, could the Chinese reverse this bleak prospect if they start now to earnestly increase the birth rate? David Huang believes it is difficult. According to him, those who are currently of childbearing age belong to the one-child policy generation and naturally form a smaller proportion. Even if they actively try to have more children, their impact is limited due to their small share. This era's population, especially those born after the 1990s and 2000s, is smaller compared to those born in the 1970s and 1980s. Even if they have two or three, or even three to four children, their contribution to population growth is not substantial because the base number is smaller. Moreover, the severe social and economic environment in China has decreased the willingness of Chinese people to have children, leading to a further decline in the birth rate. Young couples lament that they cannot afford to have children. According to research by the Suning Financial Research Institute, the budget for raising one child is nearly 500,000 yuan, nearly 69,000 US dollars. Moreover, expenses such as school district housing, summer camps, and studying abroad represent significant financial burdens. After university graduation, children may struggle to find jobs and continue to rely on their parents. Official data show that the unemployment rate for 16- to 24-year-olds, excluding students, was 14.6% in January and 15.3% in February 2024. An unfair social environment where the elite exploit the common people has prompted some young people to declare, the era of being exploited like, harvest, leaks ends with me, I will not have children anymore. Garbage Time Trends Analysis Reveals Three Major Uprisings Most Feared by the CCP The Chinese Communist Party is currently confronting a range of crises in areas such as politics and economics, causing public discontent to boil over. At this moment, the term historical garbage time emerged in Chinese society as a reflection of the populace's bleak outlook on economic prospects, following the trend of lying flat. Lu Juning, a former researcher at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, employed this term in February to describe the CCP's countdown to a potential regime change, noting that during this period, no one can alter the course of history, leaving the common people with no option but to endure by lying flat. As the CCP approached its third plenum, historical garbage time continued to stir controversy and incite panic within the party prompting state media to issue urgent rebuttals as if bracing against a formidable adversary. Wu Xiaoping, a Chinese human rights lawyer in America, recently told NTD-TV that the popularity of the term historical garbage time reflects a significant shift in the public's perception of the CCP regime. Li Yuanhua, an Australian-based historian, pointed out that the term accurately reflects the CCP's current situation and challenges, striking at its vulnerabilities. Du Wan, a former official from Inner Mongolia who has sought refuge abroad, commented to the Epoch Times that the authorities' forceful denials in an effort to restore public confidence and maintain stability only underscore the system's inefficacy and fragility in managing complex social sentiments. He highlighted that a major issue is the irrelevance of CCP's official media, which has lost its basic credibility, becoming garbage media. On July 17, Duwan analyzed from both domestic and international perspectives what the CCP fears most. Domestically, he indicated that the CCP's greatest fear, evidenced by various official meetings and organizational structures, is social instability and upheaval, particularly large-scale protests, group incidents, and local unrest, an openly acknowledged secret. The article mentioned that societal contradictions and dissatisfaction have increased in recent years due to slower economic growth, fluctuations in the real estate market, widening wealth gaps, and escalating environmental pollution. 
the CCP is especially cautious of well-educated young people, whose intense dissatisfaction and demonstrated influence were evident in the White Paper Revolution, which included calls for the resignation of Xi Jinping and the CCP. This group, being well-educated, cannot be easily deceived by simple falsehoods. Thus, from the CCP's perspective, they are more dangerous than retirees, migrant workers, and farmers. They are not merely a powder keg, they are a powder magazine. Economically, the CCP is deeply concerned about the ongoing crisis. Additionally, political corruption and internal conflicts are troubling, as factional fights and power struggles within the party present potential risks of instability. Internationally, Duwen noted that the CCP is apprehensive about facing isolation and sanctions from the international community, particularly under the leadership of the United States and Western countries. These sanctions, potentially affecting various sectors including the economy, technology, and military, could directly impact China's development and international standing. Additionally, disruptions in the global supply chain, technological blockades, military conflicts, and worsening geopolitical tensions are major concerns for the CCP. The article concluded that the CCP's greatest current fears are centered on domestic social stability and economic development, as well as international isolation and sanctions. These issues are crucial for the CCP and directly impact the well-being of the people. If these problems are not effectively addressed, nothing else will matter. Global banks cut China's 2024 growth outlook after weak GDP data. China reported its slowest economic growth in five quarters on July 15, with the National Bureau of Statistics revealing that the economy grew by 4.7% in the second quarter compared to the previous year. This slowdown from 5.3% growth in the first quarter marked the slowest pace since July 2023. The announcement coincided with the start of the Chinese Communist Party's third plenum, a critical four-day political meeting in Beijing, intensifying pressure on the regime to implement measures to bolster market confidence. Following the release of this data, several global investment banks adjusted their growth forecasts for China. JP Morgan lowered its full-year growth forecast from 5.2% to 4.7%, citing the second quarter in June data as indicators of economic fragility and instability. Societe Generale's research note highlighted severe imbalances in the economy, with notably low domestic demand and a highly deflationary policy environment. Goldman Sachs also adjusted its forecast, reducing its expectation for China's full-year gross domestic product, GDP growth from 5% to 4.9%, although it slightly increased its forecast for 2025 from 4.2% to 4.3%. The bank emphasized the continued weakness in the property sector and suggested that more policy easing, particularly in fiscal measures and housing, would be necessary throughout the year. Australian bank ANZ echoed these concerns noting that the weak GDP performance in the second quarter casts doubt on China achieving its official growth target of 5% for 2024. ANZ maintained its growth forecast for China at 4.9% for this year. Economic data China's economic growth missed expectations according to several forecasts. Growth in the April to June period reached only 4.7%, falling short of the consensus forecast of 5.1% projected by 30 economists in a Nikkei poll and underperforming the predictions of analysts in surveys by Reuters, Bloomberg, and an AFP forecast of 5.3%. On a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, GDP expanded by 0.7%, which was less than the expected 1.1% increase and below the revised 1.5% rise in the previous quarter. Domestic demand remains tepid. Retail sales of consumer goods, a primary indicator of household spending, rose only 2% year-on-year in June, a decrease from a 3.7% increase in May. Despite measures introduced by the CCP in May to stimulate the real estate market, including lowering down payment ratios, reducing housing provident fund loan interest rates, and purchasing unsold residential units for public housing, the market continues to struggle. Official data show that investment in real estate development plummeted by 10.1% in the first half of the year. Furthermore, the sales area of new homes dropped by 19%, percent 
and the sales value of new commercial housing decreased by 25%. The ongoing property crisis deepened in June as new home prices fell at the fastest rate in nine years, eroding consumer confidence and constraining local government's ability to raise funds through land sales. Economic commentator David Huang described the situation as a downward spiral with no imminent signs of recovery. He said, it will likely take some time to reach the bottom, reflecting the challenges facing China's economic stabilization efforts. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths.